we are going to review the last uh, 12 weeks in 40 minutes. So this ought to be interesting. In the 1960s, the name George Sanders was well known among the Hollywood elite. He had been married four times, was a multimillionaire, and had starring roles in over 90 movies. On one occasion, he was asked by a movie critic, is there any role that you haven't played that you would like to? Sanders replied, well, nobody has asked me to play God yet. I think I'd like to try that. A few months after this blasphemous statement on April 25, 1972, Sanders committed suicide. His lifeless body was found, and next to it, five bottles of sleeping pills and a note that read, Dear world, I'm leaving because I'm bored. In the 1990s, the name Kurt Cobain was well known among the rock and roll crowd. He was the lead singer for the grunge group Nirvana. Though wealthy and popular, he lived depressed. He repeatedly said to his wife, Courtney, I'm not, it's not fun anymore. We're just not having fun anymore. One spring afternoon, April of 1994, while Courtney was away shopping, Cobain shot himself to death in his bedroom. Kurt Cobain and George Sanders said, Life is not worth living, but the Bible describes for us a life that is worth living. For Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I find that one of the hardest things to find in life for a Christian is their purpose. It's hard to find because we're not looking in the right places for it. And so, the last 12 weeks have been a deliberate discovery of things in our lives that are obvious that we can find purpose in. And I'm repeating them today because I've said before that if we forget, it had been better as if we've never said it at all. So we must remember our purpose in life. So we're going to start out by talking about the purpose of purpose. I'm going to see how fast I can move. The first lesson we talked about was the purpose of purpose. Purpose is the practice behind the principle. Isn't it always a great joy to find purpose? It's always, it's always neat to find the thing that you've always been looking for. And I think in life we, we so desperately try to find something we're looking for, and, and it's fun to find it. And so purpose is the practice behind the principle. It's the why question. Why it is are we doing what we're doing? Why are we, why are we here this morning? Why is it that you wake up every morning and you're encouraged to read your Bible? Why is it that you go to work? We have to find the purpose to understand the why. It's important to know why we're doing what we're doing. If you don't, you won't be doing it very long. You might be doing it for a little period of time, but you're not going to be consistent about it. So we have to discover that. Paul said in Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. There has to be a purpose. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. You know, finding purpose is really as simple as finding the commands of God. What is it that God has commanded us in the Scripture? What has He said to us that we ought to do? And I tell you, I, I think it's awful simple, but if I could just sum it up this way, finding your purpose is as simple as finding the commandments of God. What has God said for you to do? Well, let's look at some of these things. What has God said for us to do? We looked, second message was the purpose of passion. The purpose of passion. It's hard to be passionate about something you don't find purpose for. You know what I mean? How do you get excited about something where you don't have any purpose? Why are we here? It's drowned out by emptiness. Passion, I said, creates productivity. Passion creates productivity. The more passionate the more productive. If you can find your purpose and be passionate, you're going to produce something. There's going to be some results. It's going to be excellent. Passion, I said, is the engine that drives the train of purpose. 
It's wonderful to have purpose, and if you don't have passion, it's just going to sit there at the station and not move. So we have to understand that this passion is, is what ignites the fire. We've got to get excited about our purpose. Find it. Grab it. Hold on to it. Embrace it. Run with it. Get excited about this thing. Passion is powerful. But passion is more than powerful. The passion that we have has to be proper. It has to be proper. I mentioned to you the 80-20 rule. That is that 80 percent of the results are produced by 20 percent of the effort we have to find out what produces the greatest result we have to have properly applied passion you can be passionate about the wrong things and not be effective so we have to have we have to have the right the proper passion someone once said just because you're doing more things doesn't mean you're getting more things done very true when it comes to your passion Make sure we're doing the right things. Not only does passion create productivity, but passion is critical for persuasion. Paul was persuasive because he was passionate. I'm convinced that's why he was so persuasive, because he had so much passion behind him. He was convinced, I'm sorry, he was convincing because he was himself convinced. I said to you, I, I could never sell something that I don't believe in. How do you do that? I, I don't know. You know, the, the really, you ought to eat your own dog food. Right? Now, to you kids in the room, don't eat dog food. The adults know what I'm talking about. We have to get excited. We have to, have, we have to be convincing. And the only way we can be convincing is if we ourselves are convinced that this is what God has called me to do. The next lesson, we looked at the purpose of perspective. The purpose of perspective. Seeing something the right way is, is important to finding, to finding purpose. Seeing something the right way. Uh, perspective is when two people look at the very same thing and see something totally different. You've all been there. You've all done that. You've all looked at something, two people looking at the same thing, and one person says, well, I see it this way. Another person says, I see it this way. That is perspective. One person said, the world changes when we change our perspective. And let me tell you, friends, if we are in the world, if we are in the world and we have the worldly perspective, we're going to miss everything that God wants us to have. We're going to miss our purpose. I mentioned there are two ways to look at this, the world's view and the word view. We can look at things through the world or we can look at things through the Word. This is a perspective. We have to have the right perspective. Biblical perspective is through the Word of God. He's given us this, and this should be how we gear and focus our lives, through the Word. And if you spend time in the world, don't be surprised if you don't find your perspective. Don't be surprised if you don't find your perspective. So we can have the world's view and the word's view. You can have an earthly view and an eternal view. The earthly view, the earthly perspective is all about the here and the now. How many people do you know that are living for just the here and the now? They're living literally for just tomorrow. This is the earthly view. This is not the eternal view. Don't live for tomorrow. You live for the hereafter. That's what the eternal view is. The earthly view is the here and now, and the eternal view is the hereafter. We need to live our lives having the right perspective through the Word of God and have an eternal viewpoint. And if we have an eternal viewpoint, we'll have a better chance of finding our purpose in life. So that was kind of the first section. Then we began to talk about specific things. Specific things like the purpose of work, right? Right? The purpose of work. I mentioned to you three different things. First of all, work so you can help yourself. There's hardly a better way to help yourself than to work. You know, I, I'm always amazed at how oftentimes we feel that work is such a burden. That this is such a terrible thing. Work is not that terrible, friends. Work was actually created... A long time ago in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. I mean, we're talking way, way, way back. It's not meant to be burdensome. 
It's burdensome now because we, sin has entered the world. And he says that we are going to labor by the sweat of our face. It has become burdensome, but it doesn't have to be burdensome. That was, wasn't why it was created. Work is one of the best ways that you can help yourself. It's one of the best ways we can help ourselves. Proverbs 13, verse 4 says, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The person who is diligent, the person who works and works hard, they shall be made fat. It doesn't mean obese. By the way, work is good for you. Well, number one, we need to work so we can help ourselves, but we also need to work so we can help others. Another purpose of work is to provide not only for your family, but also for the needy and the weak. The needy and the weak. Do you realize that all of us, pretty much, have been given enough that we can help other people? We pretty much have been given enough financially through, through work, and we're going to get into the purpose of wealth here in a moment, but we can actually help other people. And one thing that we can do, the reason, one of the reasons why we work is not just to help ourselves, but it's to help, it's to help other people. And thirdly, we need to work so we can please God. Work so you can please God. Your work glorifies God. In Colossians 3.23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men. Oftentimes people work just to please man. One of the biggest errors in, in work ethic today, that means they're working because someone else, their boss is viewing them and they say, hey, listen, Joe is a really hard worker. But they're not really doing it to please God. And our work should be, work. We, should, we should have a work ethic where we are working to please our Heavenly Father. Not just man. And let me tell you what, if you're pleasing God with your work ethic, mankind will most, most likely be, be happy with that. Because what you're going to do is you're going to work as unto the Lord. You're going to work heartily as unto the Lord. Now the purpose of work is interesting because we, we work almost every day. And even when, you're, even when you're retired, you work. Right? Isn't that right, Howard? Max? Yeah. Two super hardworking guys. Isn't that right, Bill? Got some retired people in here. I'm retired. I retired years ago. Can you imagine that? A young man, retired. I tell people I was tired yesterday. I'm tired again today. I'm retired. That joke is so old. I'm so glad you laugh at it. Anyway, the purpose of leadership. The purpose of leadership is to, is to make jokes that people laugh at. No, I'm kidding. That's not the purpose of leadership. Purpose of leadership is, um, is kind of a, a trifold. Uh, there's leadership in the government, leadership in the, the home, and leadership in the church. Leadership in the government, leadership in the home, and leadership in the church. And by the way, this is, these are the three institutions that God has ordained, by the way. And these are the three that I covered. I'm not saying that there's not more leadership out there, but these are the three I covered. Leadership in the government. Let me say this, first of all. Not all government is, is good government. Okay? But there is, but with that leadership, we have to follow where we can. Right? We have to follow where we can follow. And we have to submit where we can submit. And let me tell you, now, what, when it comes, people say, but what happens? What happens when the government tells you to do something that God tells you not to do? Well, then you submit to God, right? Acts chapter 5, verse 29, it's better to be, obey God rather than man. Now, generally speaking, for the vast majority of instances, that hasn't really happened. And we need to obey them. Ephesians 6, 5 says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling. At times, that's true. In singleness, of your heart as unto Christ. So obey leadership, governmental leadership even, servants according to the flesh, as unto Christ. Now if they ask us to go off, I mean if they go off the reservation, if they go off the radar, I mean that's, that's a problem. Now we have another issue, but we're not talking about that. Now let's talk about leadership in the home. Leadership in the home. Children are to, are to submit themselves to their parents. This is proper leadership in the home. This is the, one of the purposes of leadership, 
is you have a, you have a leadership in the, in the home. And the kids, the children, my kids, they're supposed to submit to Dana and I, my wife and I. That is their responsibility. And then there's also a, a, a relationship, a submission from the wife to the husband. Now, we're not talking about a dictatorship. We're not talking about abuse. We're not talking about abuse here. And you all know that if, 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 if a lady is in an abusive relationship, there's a problem. She needs help. She probably needs to get out. Okay? That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that, we, that the women submit to an abusive man. That's not what I'm suggesting. And I'm not saying it's, it's good for kids to submit themselves to, an, to abusive parents either. Okay? There's, there's, there's something wrong with that. But what I am saying is that the children need to submit themselves to the parents and the wives to the husbands and the husbands to Christ. Ultimately, the kids, the wife, and the husband all submitting themselves to God the Father, right? To Christ. Leadership in the church. Leadership in the church. Uh, the pastor is the head of the church, the local church. Okay, By virtue of his position, he's the CEO, if you will. He's the guy that's in charge for God here on earth, ultimately. Let there not be many masters, for you shall receive the greater condemnation. He's referring to me as a leader in this church. Okay? Now, there's a responsibility for the pastors, and there's also a responsibility for the people. The pastor is to feed and to lead, and the people are to follow and favor. To feed and to lead. 1 Peter 5, 2 says, Feed the flock of God which is among you. There it is. I'm supposed to feed. I'm supposed to teach. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So I'm supposed to feed and I'm supposed to lead, to guide. That is my role as the pastor, as the leader of the church. The church people have a role as well, and they are to follow and to favor. You're supposed to follow the leader and to favor the feeder. That's the truth of it. Following the leader. Now this doesn't mean blind leadership or, or blindly following, by the way. That's not what this means. This doesn't mean we're just going to follow Pastor Joe and just right off a cliff, right? By the way, I'm scared of heights, so I'm not getting near a cliff, okay? I don't even like roller coasters. They are to follow, not blindly. Be ye followers of me, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, even as I also am of Christ. Follow me as I follow God. That's what, it's, that's what it's saying. Follow me as I'm leading you toward Christ, Okay? So these are the roles. This is the purpose of the leadership. Uh, there is a purpose. People say, well, why are there so many leaders? Why are there so many bosses? Well, here's the purpose right here. There's leadership uh, in government, leadership in the home, and leadership in the church. Okay. The purpose of time was another lesson we covered, the purpose of time. And by the way, all of this stuff in totality will be in Finding Purpose, the book we have coming out. Uh, we're in the middle of writing it right now and adding all of our stuff. So if you're missing it, you'll have to buy the book. There's a plug for the book. Anyway, the purpose of time, the purpose of time. I, I started off the story with this, with that clock that I got from my great-great-grandfather, Leonard Wallerstead. And it was a timepiece. And he gave some really good things about time. I mentioned that time is moving. Time is moving. And there's only one exception that Time isn't moving, and that was in Joshua's day, Joshua 10 to 14, and there was no day like that before or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now remember this, by the way, that your time, your time is moving. It's amazing how, uh, how many of you guys dream at night? You guys dream, how many of you are dreamers? You dream? Nothing wrong with that. I mean, I, I mean I'm not seeing visions and dreams, but I'm saying like you, as you're sleeping, right? I, uh, I tell you, I, I have some vivid dreams, and some of my dreams last night transported me back like 20 years. And I woke up this morning, and I thought, man, I feel like it was yesterday. How many feel like that? feel like just time just clipping along, just as fast as you can imagine. Time is moving. Time, time is to be, time is measured. We all have a certain, uh, let's call it a, a life expectancy, a life expectancy, uh, it's only about 80 years, by the way. You got 70 or 80 years. That's what we got. And so remember, I, I backed out all the time I've spent already, and, I, and then I, I added in all the time in the future, and then I basically was left with a year left to live. <laughs> so It's terrible. Anyway, time is momentary. Time is momentary. Uh, 1 Peter 1.24 
It says, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. It's just momentary. James says, Life is a vapor which, which appeareth for a short time and then vanisheth away. 70 to 80 years. Some of you are living on borrowed time. You're welcome. <laughs> the retired folks. Time is to be managed. Time is to be managed. Ephesians 5.16, great verse, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming them, buying them back. Don't waste time. How often is it that we, we just we, we sit there and we, 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 don't, we feel like there's nothing to do, and, but really there's a lot to do. And there's very little time to get it done. Time is moving. Time is measured. It's momentary, and it must be managed. It must be managed. Don't waste time. There's no time to waste. One guy, he said this. He said, success is never owned. It's rented, and the rent is due every day. If you want to be successful in your life, if you want to find your purpose and do something with that purpose, it's, we, we got to do it. we got to figure it out every day. There's hardly any time to waste. We talked about the purpose of the church, the purpose of the church. Really important because we're all here in church. We ask ourselves these questions. Here it is. We, we sit here. What's the purpose of our time wasted here at church, right? So here we are. Here's time. And now here's church. The purpose of church is to exalt God. To exalt God. Now, this is the idea that, uh, that the church was created to give God the glory. The church is created to give God the glory. We're supposed to exalt God. Second, first of all, we, this happens when we give him the credit. Secondly, when we, when we exalt God uh, by being a distinct people. And thirdly, we exalt God by giving him the preeminence, making him, putting him first. And when you put God first and you give him the honor and the glory that's due, you're not wasting your time by coming to church. You're spending it very carefully and you're redeeming the time. So it's not a waste. But most people who can't find their purpose think that they're wasting their time. Why are we here at church? Why am I wasting my time? What are we doing? What is the purpose of the leadership? What is he up there for anyway? Secondly, it's to equip the people to equip the people. Uh, this is really part of the Great Commission. It's the second part of the Great Commission. We're supposed to preach the gospel and make disciples, right? We're supposed to equip the people. The church is to equip. The church is also to evangelize the world. This is the first part of the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I mentioned to you while evangelism should start local, it should, it should end global. It should start with those people around us in our community, but we need, we need worldwide evangelism. That's what it says here, isn't it? Go ye into all the world. We need global evangelism. All right, the purpose of our faith. The purpose of our faith. We're making headway. Where are we at in the outline? Second page? All right, we got a little bit to go. The purpose of faith, the purpose of faith. Uh, faith, first of all, is our hope. All we have is our hope. We, all we have is our faith. You know that? In this faith, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. That's all we have. That's why it's important. Martin Luther King Jr. said this. He said, Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. How many of us do that in our daily lives, saying, Lord, I'm going to trust you, I'm going to step out here by faith, and I'm going to step out here by faith, and I don't see the rest of the plan of life, but I'm going to keep taking a step. I'm going to trust that there's another stair there. Faith is not only our hope, but faith is our help. Faith is our help. Faith, faith provides a help for us when we live our lives among the earth. It's, this, it's, it, it, it's more than just the, uh, the help on a spiritual level in heaven, but it's our help on uh, a spiritual level here on earth. This, this really is how I get through day by day by day by day by day. It's my faith. I have to live my life by faith. Without that, I am in trouble. 
with a capital T, big time trouble. I have to have faith in my life. That is my help. Faith not only is our help, but faith is what gets us to heaven. Uh, uh, Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That's, that's our rightness. When, that's, that's reconciliation from us, with, with us with God. Our faith is not just our, not just our hope, not just our help, but it gets us to heaven. We talked about the purpose of suffering. This is a hard one. It's a hard one. Our suffering helps us. I never wanted to minimize that in the message, and I was very careful not to minimize it. Because God forbid any of us suffer, but it is at times to help us, uh, especially when it's chastening. Especially when us when it's chastening. Now, all suffering is not chastening. All suffering is not chastening. The Bible says to not despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't despise the chastening of the Lord. If God is trying to get you right, then that's important that we heed those chastening, uh, that chastening and do right by God. Our suffering doesn't just help us, but our suffering helps others. Our suffering helps others. Sometimes, the purpose of our suffering is to share with others that our suffering, the comfort we experienced while we were suffering. It's to share with them. It's to help them and say, hey, I was going through that trial. Hey, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, you know, when you were really struggling, when you were, when you were going through that really tough time, I, I had a similar situation to that. And I just trusted God. I confided in, in Him. He's my hope and He's my help. And you know what? Sometimes suffering, it, 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 it's, it's for you. And, and But let me tell you what, I, God was there for me. And sometimes it's to help other people. Our suffering also glorifies God. This doesn't mean that He likes it, by the way. Just because our suffering glorifies Him does not mean He likes it. He doesn't just say, yeah, there's suffering down there and I'm really excited. This isn't, he's not vindictive like that. But it does... It does glorify God. When we get to John chapter 9, we saw the, bl- the man who was born blind. And when he was born blind, uh, he had this, uh, he had this, uh, the disciples came to him and he said, and said, who did sin? Was it this man or his parents that he should be born blind? And he gets into verse 3 and he says, Jesus answered, neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Meaning this, the reason this guy was born blind was so that God could come by and heal him and, show, and reveal to other people his awesome glory. Sometimes when we're suffering, it's not just a chastening thing. It may be to help us, maybe to help others, but ultimately God gets the glory. The purpose of wealth, the purpose of wealth. A couple things, I mentioned two words, and then uh, two principles. Two words were, were, were contentment and covetousness. Contentment, is one of the hardest things I mentioned for a Christian to battle. That they're constantly trying to be content. How does a Christian be content? Matthew Henry said, uh, he said, uh, he is much happier that is always content, though he has very little, than he that is always coveting, though he has so very much. How much easier is it to be content when you hardly have anything than to have a lot? It's much more easy, isn't it? Because a person who has a lot just wants more. And the person who has little can say, Lord, I'm okay with this. Contentment, covetousness is another thing that's, uh, that we have to be careful of. We want to have contentment and we don't want to have covetousness. Covetousness, Luke 12, 15 says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. It's not about all your stuff. How many of us, we pile up our stuff and we say, look at that. This is what I have. Come, see my house. Let me show you my house. Let me show you this. Let me, let me show you this. Come here. Come here. I want everybody to come around. I want them to see all of my stuff. The Bible says, beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things he possesses. One day that's all going to be gone that fast. I heard this one guy said, I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You can't take it with you. The purpose of wealth as a first principle was that God 
provides our needs. God provides our needs. And if he can take care of the fowl of the air, the lilies of the field, don't you think he can take care of us? Aren't we so much greater than them? We worry so much about our provision, and really we have God. Now he has the, the, he, the resource of the universe is at his disposal. Like, poof, there's the world's. He spoke it. Worlds. And we're like, how is he going to provide food? How is he going to provide enough for me? Now, again, I don't want to minimize someone who's struggling, but listen, we're talking about God is our provisionary here. He provides our needs. The second principle is that God provides for the needs of others through us. Isn't that interesting? 1 Timothy 6, 17, and 18 Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Make sure that the wealthy people don't say, hey, I'm wealthy, look at me. Be high-minded. That's proud, by the way. Make sure they're not proud. Nor trusting in this word, I love these words, uncertain riches. Because you know what? One day, they'll be gone. And it can happen that fast. God's given us the ability to provide for the needs of others. For a long time, I've, I've had this kind of the standing thing. I, I've said, you know what, I'm not going to, um, I'm just not going to give out. People call you know, numerous times throughout the week, hey, can I have money? And I, and I have to turn, I turn them all down. I'm like, you know, I just, I just can't give money to everybody that calls. We just can't give money to everybody that calls. And, and I would hope that you would say that, that that's being a good steward of, of God's money. One time this guy came in, and I told him, I said, I just, he says, I just need $5. And I said, you know, I just, I just can't help you. And he got so mad at me. He started to walk out the door, and he came back in, and he said, you know what, matter of fact, he reaches into his pocket, gave me a handful of change, and he says, it's only 30 cents. He says, apparently you need it more than I do. And he walked out, and I said, Okay, Lord, I get it. Five dollars is not going to bankrupt this church. I said, I can at least give people five bucks. God has provided for us that we can provide for the needs of others. Now, if I'm giving out five dollars hand over fist, we're going to need bigger offerings. Five dollars is not going to bankrupt the church. Verse 18 says that they do good. This is that those are the rich of the world, that they do good, that they, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. It's our responsibility to help those people who are in need. It's also our responsibility to be stewards. So there's a balance there. We don't have time to develop that. But The purpose of family. Okay, we're almost done, guys. Whew. The purpose of family. We need to understand that family understand it within the context of a right relationship with God. First of all, that God is the one that builds our home. We talked about that last week. Psalm 127, 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. If you're trying to build your house all by yourself, without God, you're laboring in vain. Don't do it that way. Not only is, is God to build our house, but we are his co-laborers. We are part of his team, essentially. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7 and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thine might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them, your children, by the way, diligently unto your children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in the house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. We are his co-laborers. We are part of the God-building team, right? The family team. Purpose of family. Purpose of family also is to understand that we have a reward from God. Our children are a reward from God. Uh, verse 3, 127, 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. There are trophies. That's a wonderful thing. And your wife is a blessing. Your, uh, your spouse is a blessing. In this context, your wife, Proverbs 18, 22, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Your wife is a good thing. One person says, we do not live, our, live to glorify our families. Our families live to glorify God. Now, that's powerful. We don't live to glorify our families. 
so oftentimes I, I, I know that I, I know that I think women are probably a little more prone to this, so I'm not it's okay. It's okay, ladies. They want the perfect family picture. Right? And so we take a lot of pictures and then we just kind of delete the bad ones. We did this the other night. We were at uh, where'd we go? We went down to the river and took a bunch of selfies and my wife was looking through them and she's like, nah, 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 nah. Well, that's a good one. Everybody's smiling, you know. <laughs> we all want the perfect family. But we're not to be glorified by our families. Our families are there to glorify God. These are really, really important things. Now, my uncle, my uncle, who uh, graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary years ago, he got a phone call when he started his ministry years and years and years ago by a guy named uh, John Walverd, and maybe you guys don't know who that is, but he's a, he's a president of, of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. At the time, he was, I think, 93, apparently. I didn't know they had phones back then, but whatever. <laughs> yes, we did. Anyway, so he gets his phone call. He answers the phone. Hello, it's Mark. He says, Mark, this is John. John who? He <laughs> says, John Walford. Oh, hey, how are you doing, John? It's good. Yeah, apparently, they were on first-name basis. Did, did, God, did, did God call you to the ministry, he says. Well, John, yes, he did. He said, well, then fulfill your calling. Fulfill your purpose. It was the only words he had for him. If God has called you to do something, then we need to find out what it is and we need to do it wholeheartedly to God for him. Your purpose is eternal. It's not earthly. Your time must be managed so that you can have the biggest impact. Your wealth is about giving, not receiving. Your work is about pleasing God. Pleasing God in your work. Your family is about honoring God, not your family honoring you. When we find our purpose, I'm telling you what, there is such harmony in the soul. You look for what God has commanded you to do and you embrace that wholeheartedly. And you don't deviate from that path. Now listen, we're going to struggle at times with it, finding what it is, but when we have found it, it's like finding your wallet after you've lost it. It's just exciting. Your purpose ultimately starts with the plan of salvation. Do you know where you're going when you die? If you were to die today, can you honestly say, I am going to stand before the Lord or aren't you sure? But wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't you like to know where you're going when you die? I want this hand right here to represent you and me. I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. This is where purpose begins. Here we are with all of our sin. The Bible says God loves us, hates our sin. There are churches that say, well, if you live a good life, Friends, you can live a good life and never find your purpose. There are churches that say, well, you know, if you, if, if, if you just do right, do, do right to others, you, you'll, you'll have a purposeful life. And friends, you can do right to others and still never find your purpose. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says God loves us, hates our sin. The Bible says that there is a penalty for this sin. It says, it calls it a wage. The payment, that's what it is. The wages of sin is death. That's what it says. It's not turning over a new leaf and living a good life. It's not coming forward, walking an aisle, or raising a hand. The Bible says that the wages, the penalty for the sin is death. There are churches that say, well, if you just turn from your sin, you just, you just live a good life. That's what he's saying. You work for your salvation, essentially. You, you just live a good life. There are churches that say you give money to the church. You raise a hand or pray a prayer, get water baptized. The Bible says that the wages, the penalty is death. Someone has to die. Now, you can die with this sin and spend an eternity paying for it. That's true. In hell, away from God. But the Bible says that 2,000 years ago, the God-man, Jesus Christ, came to this earth to die for your sin. The wages of sin is death. Not church membership. Not giving money to the church. 
We're walking an aisle. We're praying a prayer. Someone has to die. The Bible says very clearly that you can be saved and go to heaven by faith. Not works. The Bible says it's to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly is faith. Not church membership, not water baptism, not praying a prayer, walking an aisle, confessing all of your sin. You're saved by faith. It's when you in the quietness of your mind say, Lord, the best I know how, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin, was buried and rose again the third day. For by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourselves. It's a gift. It's a gift of God. You don't do anything to receive a gift. You just receive it. Simply in the quietness of your mind, Lord, the best in high, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. He was buried and rose again the third day. When you've done that, friends, it's not by your work. It's by his work. What he did for you. Simply received by faith. Friends, if you haven't done that today, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to trust Him alone as your Savior. There's nothing more purposeful in your life. That's where purpose starts.